this is where we left off. We left off on the nucleus. Now, to review, the nucleus is one of the largest parts of the cell. It's easily visible in both simple light microscopy and especially with more advanced photos, like this photo that we have up on the screen. This is a scanning electron micrograph. Now, as we look at the nucleus, it has a membrane on the outside. We refer to the nuclear membrane as a nuclear envelope. It envelops or wraps around the nucleus. And it's one of the few double-membraned organelles. Now, as we look at the nucleus, inside of the nucleus, we store our DNA, our genetic information. And if we think of this information, it's not like there's wireless transmission of the information, like when you connect one cell phone to another cell phone. We have to have a chemical molecule physically carry the information from the inside of the nucleus to the outside of the nucleus, where the rest of the organelles can access and interact with information in chemical form. And to get information in and out of the nucleus, we have a hole referred to as a nuclear pore. So as we look at the holes in the nucleus that allow, allow information to go in and out, those holes are called the nuclear pores. Now as we look at the nuclear envelope, it has a lot of filaments holding it in place, giving it its shape. You could think of it as um, a smaller cell membrane or plasma membrane within the cell. It has its own version of the cytoskeleton, keeping the nucleus round in most cells. In other cells, the nucleus may be horseshoe-shaped, or it may have three lobes connected by two small isthmuses. So it depends on the cell type. But different cells will have specific shapes for the nucleus. Those specific shapes are going to be maintained by protein filaments within the nuclear envelope. Inside of the nucleus, when the cell is at rest, um, or for most of the cell cycle, the DNA is going to be very loosely coiled around some proteins called histones. And in that state, loosely coiled DNA around histones, we refer to the genetic code as chromatin. So when we look at the chromatin in our scanning electron micrograph on the screen, um, this whole outer region is going to be filled with chromatin, or loosely coiled DNA. And in the very center of most nuclei, there's a dark, at least one, sometimes more than one, darkened region. And that darkened, smaller spherical structure within the nuclei, excuse me, within the nucleus, is referred to as a nucleoli. When we look at the nucleoli, this is going to be a region inside of the nucleus where ribosomes are produced. So not only does the nucleus store our genetic code, our nucleus houses the nucleoli, and the nucleoli makes ribosomes for our cells. So here's a figure from your textbook. We can see we have a, for the nucleus, we have an outer membrane, which is the nuclear envelope. We have holes that are nuclear pores. There's a spherical structure on the inside, the nucleoli, and continuous with the nuclear envelope, there's a membranous structure called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough ER is almost always going to be directly next to or directly connected to the nucleus via a phospholipid layer. And we'll talk more about the rough ER in just a moment. So when we think of the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, endoplasmic reticulum, is a sac, or it's a region of membranous folds, or membranous sacs, that are parallel, flattened, and right next to each other. Now, if the endoplasmic reticulum is covered in ribosomes. We refer to it as a rough ER. And there's lots of protein synthesis that's going to be occurring at this location. So when we think of rough ER, I want you to think of an endoplasmic reticulum covered in ribosomes that focuses on making proteins which are secreted from the cell. The ribosomes on the rough ER will produce proteins that are secreted into the rough ER, and those proteins that are secreted into the rough ER will eventually make their way outside of the cell, or at the very least, into the cell membrane. The other version of the endoplasmic reticulum does not have any ribosomes. We refer to this as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. When we look at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it's Branches or folds, also called cisternae. So when we think of cisternae, think of the branches 
or membranous folds of the smoothie are. So these branches or folds of the smoothie are don't have a bunch of ribosomes on them. Instead, these areas focus on squeezing as many phospholipids into a small area as possible. And all these folds of phospholipids are thought to primarily focus on synthesizing lipids, detoxifying molecules that are toxic to our body. So what we find is that cells in our body that are in organs which detoxify stuff have lots and lots of smooth ER. I'm thinking of hepatocytes in our liver, where liver cells have tons of smooth ER. And our liver is well known for removing toxins from our bloodstream. And there's a variation of the smooth ER, smooth endoplasmic, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. We'll talk about it in our muscular unit. It's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum that's focusing on calcium ion storage. So from your text, we can see in this figure blue membranes. These sacs of blue membranes represent the endoplasmic reticulum. The purple dots in the upper left represent ribosomes. So we have a rough endoplasmic reticulum and a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Let's focus on those ribosomes. Ribosomes are one of the few non-membrane bound organelles in our cells. Most of the organelles in our cells are covered in membranes. So as we look at these ribosomes, a ribosome is going to be made of two subunits. We have the big subunit and the small subunit. And as we look at these subunits of the ribosome, they will clamp together. The big or the large and the small will connect to each other to form the ribosome. And the ribosome will typically clamp the large and small subunits together around a piece of messenger RNA. So usually there'll be a chunk of messenger RNA, think of it like a spaghetti noodle, that those large and small subunits are going to clamp on top of and then slide across. As the ribosome is sliding across the messenger RNA, it's reading our genetic code and using it to make specific proteins. Another organelle in our cell is the Golgi complex, sometimes referred to as the Golgi apparatus. Um, I'm not too married to one term or the other term. Know that the Golgi complex or Golgi apparatus <coughs> is a bunch of membranous sacs. So it's a bunch of cisternae. Now, as we're looking at the cell, we can differentiate the Golgi apparatus from the smooth ER based on what these cisternae, these membranes connect to. Smooth ER membranes, the folds of membranes that make up the smooth ER are going to eventually connect to a rough endoplasmic reticulum. So you may have to trace the line back and forth for a while, but eventually it makes its way back to the rough ER. The rough ER is notable because it has ribosomes on it and it's right next to the nucleus. We need to first, when we're looking at cell models, cell diagrams, maybe on a lab quiz or a lab exam or lecture exam, you need to identify the nucleus. It's a frame of reference in the cell. Next to the nucleus, we have the rough ER. Connected to the rough ER is the smooth ER. And disconnected from the smooth ER, we have the Golgi apparatus. So those proteins that are synthesized by the ribosomes of the rough ER, they're secreted into the rough endoplasmic reticulum then they're packaged up in a transport vesicle and sent to the, smooth, to the Golgi apparatus or Golgi complex. And while those proteins are in the Golgi apparatus, they are going to be spliced so they can be chopped up a little bit. They can be processed. To process them, we can remove some of the residual amino acids, either from the beginning or from the end. We can add glycogens to make it a glycoprotein. So if we, if we think of those glycoproteins or glycolipids that are present in the cell, this is where a lot of the processing happens. This is where we mix and match macromolecules in the Golgi complex. Now, after those proteins are processed in the Golgi complex, some of them are going to be put into another transport vesicle and excreted from the cell. We call that a secretory vesicle because it makes a secretion. Other transport vesicles are just going to carry those proteins to the cell membrane, and the transport vesicle will fuse with the cell membrane. 
And then it's go they will just become integrated to the cell membrane. So here's our Golgi complex from your textbook. So here we can see there are, in the electron micrograph, lots of overlapping sacs. And these overlapping sacs are physically distinctly separated from both the smooth ER and the rough ER. The models and diagrams we use in lab really emphasize this. They also typically are going to color the Golgi complex a different color compared to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, but when you're looking at a scanning electron micrograph, kind of like what we have up on the screen behind me, it's a little bit more difficult. You will not have to look at a SEM and identify the Golgi complex. We'll stick with figures from your text or really overemphasized models from lab. One of the other things that can be made at the Golgi complex is a lysosome or a peroxisome. Sometimes we make small membranous organelles at the Golgi complex, lysosomes being one of them. So as we look at a lysosome, I want you to think of a lysosome as digestive enzymes. It's a small package of digestive enzymes that's made at the Golgi complex and then sent to the rest of the cell. What does this lysosome do for us? It is going to be involved with hydrolysis. So it's going to grab protein molecules, carbohydrates, large macromolecules, engulf them, and then chop them up into individual monomers. And then our cell uses those individual monomers to rebuild new things. We also are going to use a lysosome for autophagy. Every once in a while, a cell hits the self-destruct button. That cell may be infected by a virus. That cell may be precancerous. Or that cell may be harboring inter, excuse me, intracellular bacteria. In all of those situations, it's better for us, the whole organism, if a few of our cells self-destruct. To quote Spock, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or more to the point, it's better for all of the cells in our body if a couple of the cells kill themselves when they're infected with viruses or they're about to turn into a cancerous tumor. That's what autophagy is. The or excuse me, autolysis, where the cell commits suicide. Autophagy is when the cell breaks down individual organelles within the cell that are degraded and need to be recycled and reprocessed. Another one of the organelles that comes from the Golgi apparatus is the peroxisome. The peroxisome is similar in ultimate function to the lysosome, but there's a key difference with the peroxisome. Lysosomes function by having lots of digestive enzymes, or proteins that stimulate and promote hydrolysis of macromolecules. Lyse peroxisomes function by having free radicals, strongly oxidizing chemicals in the cell. The two most common strongly oxidizing chemicals that are in the peroxisome are peroxide, hence its namesake, and we also have superoxides as well. You can think of these free radicals or these strongly oxidizing chemicals as waste products. These are waste products as part of ATP synthesis within the electron transport chain. And those waste products can be concentrated within the peroxisome. What do we use the peroxisomes for? They can actually neutralize free radicals. In a chemical sense, and I'm going to go back to chemistry. I know we didn't talk about Lewis um, bonding pairs and lone electron pairs in chemistry. We didn't have time to review that earlier. But electrons like to be paired with an upspin and a downspin electron being paired within a suborbital. If you have a, a suborbital with only one electron, either an upspin or a downspin, one electron by itself in a suborbital, that is a free radical. It's an electron looking for a friend. And these electrons are so aggressively seeking out another electron to bind to that these free radicals in our cells have a habit of making and breaking covalent bonds that hold macromolecules together. They cause damage, and they aren't good for us. But if you take one free radical and combine it with another free radical, you can take a lonely electron and pair it with another lonely electron to make that electron pair. So the free radicals within a peroxisome are capable of neutralizing other free radicals within our cells. 
We also are going to use this free radical to break down fatty acids. Um, particularly, we're going to, we are going to remove two carbons at a time from the fatty acid tail of um, a triglyceride, and we'll pump those two carbons at a time into the citric acid cycle. This is a process of making ATP from stored body fat. So the peroxisome is an important organelle we use to digest fat and turn the fat into cellular energy. So as we look at lysosomes and peroxisomes, visually, gall darn it, they look almost identical on the electron micrograph. They're little circles with a membrane around them. In your lab, they're colored different colors. I want to say on the big cell model, it's kind of a, I want to say periwinkle, kind of a gray purple for the peroxisome and the lysosome is colored yellow. Most cell models just use different colors because structurally they look nearly identical to each other. We also have some proteases. This is another non-membrane bound organelle within our cell. When we think of a protease or a proteasome, these are going to be a small structure in our cell that helps proteins fold and also is going to remove surplus proteins. So as we look at these proteasomes, we are going to take a protein that maybe is no longer needed. Let's say we had some kind of a stressful event in our life. And when I say stressful, I don't mean emotionally stressful, I mean physiologically stressful. Maybe you were fasting for a day and a half, you know, maybe on purpose or not on purpose, Regardless of the reason, maybe you decide to go on a two- or three-day fast. When you go on a two- or three-day fast, your body switches which proteins are activated and, which, pro and which, gene or which genes are activated and which genes are deactivated. That changes the enzymes and proteins present in your cell, and you alter your physiology in response to those stresses you're placing on your body or those different environments you're exposing your body to. And then you break the fast. You go and you start eating meals again. So after not eating food for a day or two, you start eating regular meals again. Your body then needs to go back, revert back to the other metabolic pathways and the enzymes that it made to help you cope with being in a fasting state are no longer necessary or needed. They're actually harmful. So this is where the proteasome will come in and those enzymes are tagged and then destroyed by the proteasome and broken into individual amino acids or, so we have the monomers, or occasionally dimers or trimers of those amino acids. In other words, we have the non-useful protein chopped up into little pieces. We also have mitochondria. This is one I'm sure has been beat to death for you, so we're not going to spend a ton of time in this unit on the mitochondria. Wait till we get to the electron transport chain. So when we think of the mitochondria, it's the powerhouse of the cell. That's typically the analogy that every middle school science teacher will use for that organelle. This is a double membrane organelle. It has an inner membrane and an outer membrane. The inner membrane folds back and forth on itself again and again and again, dramatically increasing the surface area on the inside of the mitochondria. As we're looking at that inner membrane, it will make a fold. The fold is called the cristae, and there's empty space. Well, not empty space. There's some liquid in between the folds. The innermost liquid is called the matrix, sometimes referred to as mitochondrial matrix. We want to be a little bit more precise. Within the mitochondria, um, there's some really cool genetic analysis that's been done of the mitochondria. There's a lot of strong evidence that supports the theory that a mitochondria used to be a separate organism that was phagocytized by a cell and then formed a symbiotic relationship with the cell that phagocytized it, and now it can't exist outside of that cell. And we, as, uh, well, as humans, now have mitochondria in nearly every cell of our body. Not every, but nearly every. Um, one of the things that strongly supports this theory is the fact that mitochondria have their own genomes. Not only do they have their own genome, they have their own ribosomes on the inside of the mitochondria, and mitochondria reproduce separately from the rest of the cell. There's a completely separate mitochondrial reproductive cycle that we're not going to talk about in this class. Um, and we could go on for a very long time about mitochondria. I think they're pretty cool. Um, here's a figure of a mitochondria. Um, the models in lab don't do a good job of representing how many folds are on the inside of the mitochondria. We have an electron micrograph 
on the left-hand side of the screen with some false color added. The blue lines on that electron micrograph represent the membrane on the inside folding back and forth on itself again and again and again. So there's a very high surface area on the inside of the mitochondrion. My, and in case you're curious, mitochondrion is the singular. Mitochondria is the plural. And those folds that are on the inside, those cristae on the inside of the mitochondria, are what give us the highest surface area that allow for lots of chemical reactions to occur. We also have a centriole and a centrosome. We talked about this in lab last week because we needed to cover them in order to talk about microtubules and mitosis. So we think of a centriole. A centriole is one cylinder. Um, actually, I'm just going to skip back to the figure. So here is a centriole. It's one of the cylinders. So if you, and the analogy I at least use for my lab sections is they look like churros because they have all of those ridges that go longitudinally with the cylinder. And as we look at a centriole, it's made of lots of microtubules. Microtubules will grow out and be originated from the centrioles. And if we take two centrioles and combine them together at a 90 degree angle to each other, we make a centri centrosome. And these centrioles will make the cytoskeleton filaments that are used for membrane extensions, either microvilli, cilia, or flagellum, depending on what we're looking at and what cell type we're looking at. The centrioles that make up the centrosome are also responsible for making the cytoskeleton, which ultimately gives the cell its shape. So all of these organelles will be interconnected to each other. Another way these organelles are interconnected to each other is the cytoskeleton, which originates at the centrosome, is going to help give structure and organization to all the organelles in the cell. We also have inclusions in the cell. When we think of an inclusion, you could just think of a storage vesicle. Uh, probably the most popular, the most well-publicized storage vesicle or inclusion is the central vacuole within a plant cell. Most plant cells have this giant blob of water stored in the middle of them. All plant cells will typically reserve some water just in case. Human cells typically won't reserve water like plant cells do. Instead, we get drinks of water when we're thirsty. But we will store other things in our cells, like glycogen or pigments or fat. So depending on the cell type, we're going to have different things stored in them. For instance, hepatocytes, liver cells, store lots of glycogen. Melanocytes, cells that make uh, melanin, store lots of pigment. And adipocytes, or adipose cells, are cells that store lots of fat droplets on the inside. So depending on the cell type, we're going to have different inclusions on the inside of the cell. We also can use the inclusions to store foreign bodies. When a cell is phagos or a foreign body is phagocytized by a white blood cell or leukocyte, it's going to be wrapped in part of the cell membrane. And as the cell membrane pinches off, that layer of the cell membrane going around whatever was phagocytized or pinocytized is immediately going to be recategorized as an inclusion. So we can store viruses, bacteria, dust particles, pretty much anything that can be phagocytized or pinocytized can be stored in an inclusion. As we look at this inclusion, eventually we are going to have the membrane break down. These inclusions aren't long term. So they're never going to be stored in a unit or cell membrane for long term. And it's a key um, caveat. So these are temporary storage structures. And because they're temporary, we don't need them for the cell to stay alive. They can come, they can go. Um, we do not have eight minutes. Well, hmm, no. <coughs> if you're looking for a good review of organelles, um, outside of class, click on this video link that I included. Um, it came out in 2006. Um, it's titled The Inner Life of a Cell or The Inner Workings of a Cell, and it's pretty amazing. It does a great job of showing how all of these different organelles 
interact with each other within a cell. I'm curious though, is this link still active? So, oh, nope. Yep, the link is still active. And then finally, we have a review question to finish off our discussion of organelles. This is where I hoped I, to be at the end of class last Thursday. So, pull out your cell phones or follow along on computers. We have a participation question for you. Which of the following gives a cell structural support, determines the shape of the cell, and directs the movement of substances throughout the cell? Our options are A, cholesterol, B, the nucleus, C, the plasma membrane, D, the Golgi complex, or E, the cytoskeleton. Make sure you answer the question. I'm grading you on whether you answer the question for participation purposes. It's okay to get it wrong. I love that we're talking to each other. That's perfect. We're down to 15 seconds. Submit your answers. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's see how we did as a class. So, as a class, it looks like the two most popular answers, and it's kind of an even split, were the plasma membrane and the cytoskeleton. So let's talk about this before I show the answer. In terms of what helps determine the cell, or what directs the movement of substances through a cell, the cell membrane absolutely controls what goes in and out of a cell. Within a cell, or when we say through a cell, I could have been clear with that. I meant on the inside of a cell or within a cell, and that's going to be the cytoskeleton. Those transport vesicles move along the cytoskeleton within the cell. When we look at determining the shape of the cell, the cell membrane um, is kind of like the outside of a tent. So if you ever camped in a tent, you have that canvas sheet. The canvas sheet if you don't hold it up, it just falls down on the ground. It doesn't do anything good for you. It's the tent poles that give shape to the canvas sheep. Sheet, not sheep. Ugh. Um, and in the, same, no, in the same way, it's the cytoskeleton that gives shape to the cell membrane. And the cell membrane can constantly bend and flex to wrap around our cytoskeleton. When we think of structural support and shape, those go hand in hand. Movement through the cell is going to be those transport vesicles moving on microfilaments within the cell. Our correct answer, if you hadn't guessed by now, is the cytoskeleton. All right, we're done with that presentation. Let's move on to molecular biology. We're going to take another four-credit class and squeeze it into a chapter. Or maybe it's a five-credit class here. I'm not 100% sure. So let's talk about molecular biology. Some key things that we're going to focus on in this presentation class include protein synthesis. We're also going to focus on mitosis. And we're also going to focus on DNA replication. Those are the three big ideas or concepts that I want you to focus on as we're reviewing these concepts. So as we look at the cell, we have a cell membrane on the outside. We have a nucleus on the inside that stores the DNA. This should be review for you at this point. Within the nucleus, we have DNA. If the DNA is loosely coiled, we call it chromatin. When that DNA is tightly coiled around itself, we recategorize it a chromosome. A lot of times you'll hear the language where people will say that chromosomes condense from the chromatin. It's the idea that these loose strands of DNA will automatically, all by themselves, wrap up to form the chromosomes. And as we look at this chromosome, we have some branches to it. Most duplicated or replicated chromosomes will have four chromatids. And the chromatids that are right next to each other are referred to as sister chromatids. And the 
sister chromatids are going to have nearly identical genetic code. Um, the similarity of a sister chromatid, one sister chromatid to another sister chromatid, is kind of like one arm to another arm. So your left arm and right arm are nearly identical to each other, but there's going to be little differences. Maybe you have a mole on one hand and not on the other hand. There'll be little tiny changes from one arm to the other arm. In the same way, even though the genetic code is identical, there are the same genes on one sister chromatid and the other sister chromatid. There can be little tiny point mutations from one gene to another gene. So there can be very small changes to genetic code. We also talked about this organelle just earlier today, the centrosome, which is made of two centrioles. We use chromosomes and centrosomes as an essential part of our discussion of the cell cycle. Now, before we can get to mitosis, um, we need to talk about interphase, the first part of the cell cycle. So before a cell can replicate itself, it needs to be ready to replicate itself. A key thing that needs to happen is the unduplicated chromosomes the cell starts out with need to become duplicated chromosomes. So before we can even have mitosis and cytokinesis, we need to go through DNA replication. We need to make a copy of the genome so that the two daughter cells can have a copy of the genome. So when we're looking at this process, as we're replicating the genome, adenosine A will base pair with T, cytosine C will base pair with guanine G. And this is the standard base pairing rules. When we look at A and T, there'll be two hydrogen bonds. C and G will have three hydrogen bonds holding them together. So during this DNA replication process, step number one is we need to access the genetic code. I consider unwinding the DNA from the histones to be kind of like pulling a book off the bookshelf. Before you can read anything, you need to get the book off the bookshelf and make it accessible. And in the same way, before we can access the genetic code in our DNA, we need to unwind that DNA so that the DNA is accessible. So it goes from being tightly coiled chromosomes, we unwind the chromosomes, and revert it back to the chromatin state. And now in the chromatin state, we need to open up the genetic code to read and access the genetic code. So step one is pulling the book off the bookshelf. Step two is physically opening the book. And in the case of DNA, we have an enzyme called DNA helicase. We know it's an enzyme because it ends with A-S-E, that ACE suffix is the standard nomenclature for enzymes. What does DNA helicase do? It spins around in a helical DNA molecule and unwinds it. More specifically, DNA helicase is going to separate those hydrogen bonds that hold the nitrogen spaces together. And that's how we unzip the DNA. Um, DNA helicase is the punchline of a bunch of really bad jokes because it unzips your genes. You don't have to look hard to find bad jokes about that one. So as we look at the next step, step number three is reading and copying the genetic code. And this is where DNA polymerase comes in. There are different kinds of DNA polymerase. Um, as its name implies, it ends with the ASE. DNA polymerase is an enzyme that makes DNA polymers. In other words, it's going to connect a bunch of DNA base pairs to each other. To determine which DNA base pairs are added to the growing fragment or strand of DNA, DNA polymerase will read the parent strand. So here we have the DNA that's being replicated. DNA helicase will unzip it. As DNA helicase unzips it, we go to single-stranded DNA. That single-stranded DNA will then have its nitrogenous bases exposed. And because one nitrogenous space will make um, two hydrogen bonds, and the other nitrogenous space will make three hydrogen bonds, and there's some directionality to these, we can follow the base pairing rules. It's just geometry. So then we're going to connect individual nucleotides to the replicated strand. So we take one double-stranded piece of DNA, make it single-stranded, attach new subunits, 
and then end up with a new double-stranded piece of DNA. <coughs> now that original double strand, the parent DNA molecule, is going to give us two single-stranded pieces after in the middle right here. So let me switch colors here. I'll go to red because it's getting kind of clustered. So on the top we have green for one. We also have the second daughter strand forming on the bottom. So we have another single-stranded piece of DNA. DNA polymerase will add more subunits to that single strand, and ultimately we end up with another double-stranded piece of DNA. So we start with one double-stranded DNA molecule, and ultimately we end up with two double-stranded DNA molecules. It's DNA replication. And because chromosomes are just really big pieces of DNA, when we replicate the DNA molecule, we go from an unduplicated to a duplicated chromosome. Now, as we're looking at this process, um, I got a little ahead of myself here with describing the process, um, but there's a key phrase that I put in red for you um, called semi-conservative replication. This semi-conservative replication means that the parent strand, those original monomers that made up the parent strand, are going to be reused and recycled and incorporated into the daughter strands of DNA. So, the daughter strand of DNA is going to be half old, half new. One piece of the double-stranded DNA, one side of the double-stranded DNA comes from the parent. The other side of the double-stranded piece of DNA is going to be brand new and made on the spot. So it's semi-conservative replication. We have one old and one new helix combined together in the daughter strand. So now we've made the new DNA. And it's not enough just to have that new DNA just hang out in the cell. We need to do something with it. So we're going to start to repackage that DNA molecule. And as we repackage this new DNA molecule, we're going to need to make new proteins for it to wrap around. So we'll make new histones. And as we make more histones, the DNA molecule wraps around the histones. And then they just keep wrapping around themselves over and over again. Let's back up a couple slides here. So here we have a naked strand of DNA. It wraps around the histones. The histones will wrap around themselves. And then those, after wrapping around themselves, they wrap around themselves again and then again and then a couple more times. And then you get a chromatid. So as we're looking at this process of wrapping the DNA around a histone, DNA plus a histone is referred to as a nucleosome. It's just a process of wrapping DNA and organizing it with a protein base. Now as we look at this process of making new DNA, it makes mistakes. You've been very gracious. Nobody's emailed me to say, hey, Mr. Durst, you have a bunch of typos in your announcements. But I usually have one or two really stupid looking typos per class announcement that I make. I see a couple of people nodding up, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, for the record, I do my best. Um, but when we think about this process of copying information down, every time we copy information down, there's going to be little mistakes. For those of you that are computer science nerds, you know that when you go from a raw image format, compress it to a JPEG, and then expand it back to a raw image format, and reconvert the file back to the original format, you're never going to have the same file quality. There's always going to be all kinds of introduced errors. Uh, the example that most of you can understand is making photocopies on a Xerox machine. When you go to a Xerox machine to make a photocopy, it's a pretty good representation of what you ran through it, but there's always going to be mistakes. And then as you make photocopies of your photocopies of your photocopies, those mistakes build up over time through every round of cell replication. Now, I want to emphasize that our DNA is incredibly accurate. It is the, our ability to replicate DNA is more accurate and has fewer mistakes than any other known mechanism that's been discovered. The ability to copy information within our genome is more accurate and more precise than any control C, control V on a computer file. There are way more mutations or mistakes introduced in computer code when we copy a computer file compared to copying DNA. The problem is, is how important DNA is. If one of your, you know, selfies get corrupted, 
No biggie. You delete the file and you move on with your life. But if your genes get corrupted, you get cancer. Or you develop cystic fibrosis. Or you develop these horrible diseases. Yes, occasionally you do have mutations that are good for you, but overwhelmingly mutations are going to be bad for us as organisms. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that makes the new DNA molecule, occasionally makes a mistake. Not that many, but every once in a while. I mean, look at this, one error per billion. That's amazing. That's amazingly accurate. But when it does make a mistake, we call that mistake a mutation or a change to the genome. And there's different kinds of mutations. In molecular biology, there's whole units dedicated to transposable elements or point mutations or you can have insertion or deletion mutations. Um, we're not going to focus on the different kinds of mutations. We'll just kind of bring them all together and categorize them as a change to the DNA code. Oops. There we go. Um, ah, what the heck. Let's see if I can make this video work. I want to see if I can play this video for you. I've never played a video in this classroom well using my laptop. So I don't know if you can get any audio. Well, turn off my